Why wait years for 5G when carrier Wi-Fi performs surprisingly well? And you can have it today. To discuss this and a lot more, my guest today is Jonas Björklund, CTO of Aptilo Networks. Join us right after this short break. All right, welcome back everyone and happy holidays to all of you out there. This is, can you believe it, episode 50, at least I think it's episode 50 of Wi-Fi Now TV, the show that brings you all the great stories and not least all the great people from across the Wi-Fi industry. So today we're going to dive into some of the lesser known but very important performance aspects of carrier Wi-Fi together with uh, my guest, Jonas Björklund of Aptilo Networks. He's CTO of Aptilo Networks, by the way. And Jonas has some great insights into this and we'll get to him in just a moment. Now, before I do that, I wanna make my uh, usual uh, self-promoting plug here because I want you to know that we're taking Wi-Fi Now, the expo and conference to the great city of Washington, DC, this April 18th to 20th. We were there last year and we had a blast. So we're going back to DC in about uh, four months time. We're already open for business, meaning you can already reserve your ticket. And if you're interested in exhibiting or uh, in some other role at Wi-Fi in DC, you better be quick because we're filling up really fast for this one. For all the details, go to Wi-Fi now events.com slash USA. And if you have any questions, drop me a line at Klaus at Wi-Fi now events.com. So that's it for my plug. And I'm delighted to welcome to Wi-Fi now TV for the first time, Jonas Bjorklund of Aptilo Network, CTO of Aptilo Networks, I should say. Jonas, great to see you and thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be talking to you, Klaus. Good, Good stuff, Jonas. Let's start by talking about, as I said, some of the lesser known aspects of Wi-Fi performance specifically about latency. Mm -hmm. So maybe before we go into the Wi-Fi part of it, just tell us why you think or why everybody thinks that latency is important and how latency affects the user experience on wireless networks. Yeah, I think there is, the latency is, is probably more important than we sometimes give it credit to, generally speaking. And there's a, there's a lot of talk about the throughput and the bandwidth you can get, and, and people are generally aware of that. And, but it's not really the only thing, and it's, it's maybe not even the major thing for many of the applications. Um, I think modern, you know, modern apps and, and web applications as well, they're really chatty, and you have to wait a lot for signals going back and forth. So use experience is really depending quite a bit on latency. And, and there's, that's also like the general consensus I would say in the business that you know 5G is promising you know lower latency is really the maybe the biggest one of the biggest differences compared to 4G it's it's so uh, right so really right exactly right. yeah I was just going to say when people talk about 5G and I have this discussion with a lot of people nearly on an ongoing basis they mention latency perhaps as the most important requirement right um, or low latency I should say but I know you've studied this and you also said that Wi-Fi already has uh, a remarkably low latency. And I think this is actually not particularly well known. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, so a properly installed and operated Wi-Fi network can really deliver on low latency. And I think that's uh, partly because of the, the way the protocol is structured that, and how it's all set up. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, there are drawbacks in Wi-Fi as well, but there's an advantage that there's low latency. The client would transmit as soon as it has a chance to. And, it, and if, if the network is, you know, not overly congested, if it's, if it's properly dimensioned for the use case, people will see a lot of, you know, low latency numbers compared to other types of connectivity wireless. Right, and maybe share with us some of the numbers here, uh, Jonas, because uh, I know you've, you've tested this, maybe not so scientifically, but you've run some tests yourself on, uh, in various scenarios. And uh, most of the time, it looks like uh, Wi-Fi, I think for one carrier, one carrier is presumably your customer, was uh, the, the Wi-Fi latency was three times uh, less or one third the latency of, of what the same carrier could provide on LTE, right? 
Yeah, yeah, and that's not over saying it, stating it as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. and especially if you are in an indoor environment where, where the LTE coverage is, is struggling or even worse if you're roaming internationally with over a mobile network and the traffic is, is transported back to your home network, latency is going to be really low. It's it, the, the use case for you to move over to Wi-Fi and be served on Wi-Fi. Uh, a, thir a third of the latency is, is going to be even a bigger difference. Uh, yeah, so I, we, I mean, you could look at the, there are some numbers out for the average latency in LTE networks in the US that you could look at and compare that with you, what you could sell for your test maybe mm -hmm. in, uh, in a Wi-Fi network. And yeah, the, the Wi-Fi is delivering on that already. And, and, and especially in those indoor, you know, cramped, crowded environments, it's really mm -hmm. useful to be on Wi-Fi. Right, and I remember I saw one of your slides where you described, there's, there's a couple of things, there's a good analogy, I think, uh, where you compare uh, the latency of a network, uh, as like the stoplights, was it? And, and the speed, as the speed between the, sp between the lights, something like that. There's no point being on a highway with, with, where you can you know, have unlimited speeding and have, have as much speed if you want, if you have to stop at stoplights along the way and, and wait for, for the signal in that case, in, in the case of connectivity to go back and forth. Yeah, so we made the analogy, analogy with, with, uh, with mm -hmm. the stop I think, a, I think that's a really good analogy. And, and right, I think that's a really good analogy. And the other thing I wanted to say was you also gave an example I've seen uh, before of if you have a low latency, latency system, uh, just a couple of megabits per second might actually, from a user point of view, perform better than high speed and coupled with high latency but that's presumably because of the nature of the apps that we typically use yeah yeah you would see that you, if you do a bandwidth check you have plenty of bandwidth in LTE but it's still the apps are not really functioning you're not getting the response times that you that you want and, and moving them to something where the Wi-Fi network is slower but you have the lower lower latency and, and suddenly it works I've seen that many times myself mm -hmm. and uh, I know that you also did some you did some testing in, uh, it, it, actually, I think it was in Las Vegas where you had some really crazy numbers for the latency. It was something like uh, 10 times higher latency or something like that on, yeah, on yeah. networks as opposed to Wi-Fi. And at that point, you were using uh, presumably, uh, what, open public Wi-Fi networks or what was that? I was used, the Wi-Fi networks that were available, there was one at the event at the show itself that worked real well. And it was, I was I tested in my hotel and in different couple of the other hotels. And the experience was consistent. The LTE was struggling to deliver low latency, whereas the Wi-Fi networks seemed to be all right in, 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 in those locations, at least. And then, yeah, right. you, definitely the case that I would have want my service provider to help me over on Wi-Fi and help me authenticate on Wi-Fi rather mm -hmm. to you just used LT. It, it served my applications much better. So, so just to be clear, we're talking about uh, maybe 10, 20, 30 uh, milliseconds in latency on Wi-Fi versus, in some cases, several hundred milliseconds, maybe in the worst case, on LTE. So that's a huge difference, right? Yeah. And, and my, the reason I started talking or thinking about this, maybe a little bit extra at CTA, was the fact that there was this all this talk about 5G and how the major one of the major promises of 5G was the reduction of latency and I was like but we already have it I I have it connecting the other network I'm getting it so so if all those beautiful applications that will come in future with 5G it's gonna the mobile operators gonna roll out these new services that they cannot do today because they have too much latency is one of the problems they could start doing them they could start delivering those services today if they if they do it over Wi-Fi. But on the other hand, it's not very well known uh, that Wi-Fi has such a low latency. Uh, you know, I, because I, I, don't think, I just don't think people know this. And I don't know why that is. Yeah, it depends on who you talk to, I guess. Oh, OK. There is a lot of strong Wi-Fi advocates in the world. But also, there's a lot of Wi-Fi bashing going on as well, right? That, that would say that it's because you run into a lot of bad Wi-Fi networks. I mean, that's a common user experience that, that there are Wi-Fi networks not functioning. But then. There's, there, there's typically an explanation to that. It's not the protocol or the technology itself. It's the way it's been set up and maintained that it's not properly done. Yeah, that's what I find as well. It's especially the unmanaged Wi-Fi that's really, really bad. And that obviously gets, uh, 
gives people a, a bad impression of what's going on and that's not good. So we need to change all that. Aptila, of course, does all the management, I have to say. So that's a bit of a difference. So we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. So just um, uh, tell me a little bit about how you think uh, Wi-Fi might fit into the 5G picture. I don't know if you've had some uh, you know, time to think about that, because, but there are, there are different schools of thought here uh, as far as that's concerned. I think the general consensus is that it's going to be a part of what 5G is. If Wi-Fi is going to be part of the service delivery also in 5G, there are going to be devices that have Wi-Fi chipsets and the services that you provide over 5G is going to be part of, you know, going to be delivered over Wi-Fi as well. I think Wi-Fi investments today will serve people that are deploying 5G as well. It will be mm -hmm. that next generation network as well. Yeah, uh, that's, that's what I think. And I think the uh, control plane integration will be there. So subscribers, devices, I mean, if we're thinking IoT, uh, all those connectivity needs that are being served by the 5G radio itself on a control plane level, that's, those devices are also going to be possible to serve over Wi-Fi with, with the, uh, Wi-Fi of course have not only technology, you know, advantages to it, but it also has the fact that it's in so many devices. I mean, that's really the, the unstoppable force of Wi-Fi, that the mm -hmm. sheer amount of devices that are out there, that our people are expecting to be able to connect. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, absolutely. But exactly how, I mean, I don't, I'm not really a 5G expert, how we are going to integrate uh, the, the authentication, the control, the policies, or from 5G to Wi-Fi, that's, that's not set in stone. I'm sure we will be able to figure it out. I mean, we could, we could be able to support and deal with that. Mm -hmm. And the point right now here today is more that if you trust that Wi-Fi, you, you don't have to throw that investment away. It's going to be useful uh, with the Wi-Fi network and have that footprint. When 5G comes, you're going to be, you know, big strength for you as an operator, service provider, if you have access to that. Absolutely, and we have AX also coming up inside of uh, maybe 18 months, uh, two years, something like that. And, 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 and let's talk a little bit about the timing as well, because um, presumably it's going to be a number of years before 5G, uh, whatever it happens to be, uh, when it, once it is uh, properly defined and so on, actually hits the markets. So in the interim, of course, uh, you know, Part of the idea here is, is, is that Wi-Fi is, is something very useful uh, to invest in, especially for carriers. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 2020 seems to be like the magic year when the first commercial Wi-Fi deployments will, 5G deployments will start happening. So then that's not too far. That's probably, I would guess that's an optimistic. There would be the first few countries where you will see uh, 5G uh, being deployed, my, my, my home country, Sweden, we just announced that uh, Telenor and Telia will collaborate on the 5G network and they would say it's operational in 2020. And that's probably one of the first places where it's happening as far as I understand. Uh, but then it's still gonna be a very small fraction of users, of course, and, and, and it's gonna take then, I don't know, another five years in some places, 10 years before we have, before we have you know, any, Total 5G rollout in the world, mm -hmm. and, and to sit on the fence and just wait with with our, if if low latency is one of the critical things, high capacity networks, then it would make sense to to use Wi-Fi in in between and invest in that. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, yeah, so right. In in one of the um, one of the uh, propositions I'm pitching is that between now and whenever 5G happens, there is going to be kind of a, a little bit of a vacuum in the wireless industry. And given, you know, among other things, the, the, you know, the excellent performance of Wi-Fi, not just in latency, but also in speed and so forth, there's a real opportunity there for uh, service providers and of course tech vendors in the industry to capitalize on Wi-Fi in the interim here. Would you agree with that? Yeah, in the interim and then feel safe that it's also going to be, of course, and Wi-Fi is also evolving, you know, not to mention that. So mm -hmm. 2020, 2025, what's Wi-Fi going to be? It's going, I mean, it's going to evolve and, and keep probably its lead since it has a shorter cycle of development. It's going to be faster in a way forever, I guess, as long as there's, there's this momentum in the Wi-Fi business. So Investing in that now, having something to work on, making money from, be relevant to your subscribers mm -hmm. until 5G and then also beyond 5G. When, when mm -hmm. I 
in parallel too, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, we couldn't agree more on that. So let's say we've got another, I don't know, four or five years of um, or delay maybe is not the right a, a, a word, but before something uh, you know significant happens in 5G. Yeah. Sorry? Waiting in the vacuum of 5G. Yeah. Yes, let's, let's say we've got that, then you know, what should uh, service providers out there, for that matter, anybody in the tech industry, wireless tech industry, be doing right now with Wi-Fi? Because you know, there, there are big opportunities. I mean, what are the, can you give us some examples of what they should be doing? I, would, we, I think there's a big opportunity for service provider to do more in Wi-Fi. There are some that are doing it and are doing it right, and, and, and they have benefits, large, big benefits of that. And they're, they, they could do it, they could do it, the, the ones that are already doing it, they could promote it more, they could make, you know, make more use of it, or deploy more services. And the ones, the operators that don't have service provider, that don't have a Wi-Fi strategy today, they should really, you know, sit down and, and decide and, and get one, a strategy in place for, uh, because they, there, there are many upsides to, to a service provider deploying Wi-Fi. Uh, of course, there's, uh, if they go out, it's, it, it can be a really good driver for them in a B2B type market offering. Uh, and they always have the benefit of getting that indoor coverage. Uh, they stay relevant to the subscribers. Subscribers really want Wi-Fi if, they're, if they can get that in a nice, you know, high quality way from their service provider. That will motivate their, their monthly bill uh, for, for their mobile service subscription. So, there's a whole bunch of stuff that makes Wi-Fi relevant to, to service providers. They should, they should put together a nice portfolio of offering that is attractive to the venues, to the location owners. I mean, all the different places where Wi-Fi can be deployed, they need to tweak their offering a little bit differently uh, so that they get access to that footprint uh, and can, can start installing and operating Wi-Fi in those places. Mm. And then of course, bundling nicely with their and user uh, services that they have and the, and the subscriptions that they provide. Right, and I know you guys have been working very hard on uh, the venue Wi-Fi uh, platform that you guys just launched. And uh, you're not alone, of course, there's a, there's a bunch of other uh, vendors also uh, offering similar uh, platforms to enable carriers uh, to serve venues with professional Wi-Fi. How, are, how is that working out for you? What's the level of interest? And do you see that as a growth area right now? Absolutely. I mean, that was, that was our plan when we developed that new component in our platform. And, and of course, it is to tap into the value that Wi-Fi has, both for the service provider and the venue. I mean, they share a network in a way and, and uh, maximize the value for both of them. So. There are, there are really three players involved. The end user need to have easy to use uh, service that are you know, perfect for the end user. Then the venue need to have their customer engagement features. They need to know what's going on. They can, they can populate their existing uh, customer system, uh, you know, whether it be CRM systems or, or uh, they have mm -hmm. um, you know, loyalty program system, whatever it is. So the venues advertising that they need to do. So there's a whole lot of features that the system need to support to take care of them. And then the operator, they have their offering, they need, have their needs, their control uh, of the network and to provide the quality service that a service mm -hmm. you know, stands for and, and need to do it. Right, and there's still the, the, the issue of, or the value, I should say, of, uh, of retention towards the subscribers. And I know you guys have been working on this, studying this, and of course you have a number of uh, or many uh, carriers that use this to their benefit, uh, namely providing carrier Wi-Fi or venue Wi-Fi for that matter to retain customers. And can you say a little bit about that? Because I, because I know there's there's a there's a huge business benefit there from the retention alone. So yeah, so there 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 absolutely there's two two completely different w retentions we, we've been talking about. So one is, of course, with the, as a mobile operator, your end user, the subscriber, uh, will experience a better service if you provide also Wi-Fi to them when they are in places where, for instance, the mobile network is otherwise weak. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also the fact that they, they know that Wi-Fi is something that they want to have. They have that, everybody have that drive. So the mobile operator that serves them, you know, with that function, that network, uh, are going to be more important to them. So they're going to be less inclined to sw jump between operators and leave you as a service provider mm -hmm. if you do that for them and stay relevant that way. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and then as an as a ISP as a or as a cable operator, um, as long as you're just delivering broadband connectivity, of course, and, and maybe some other features, then you are subject to uh, stiff price competition in some markets. Uh, but if you, on top of that, deliver a nice uh, public Wi-Fi solution, then you have a much wider group within the location owner involved. You have marketing people, you have salespeople involved, you know, liking your service, and they're going to be much less inclined to switch to another broadband provider. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a huge value. It's, it's hard to calculate in money, of course. There's a big cost of getting new customers on board, and, and that cost you can save if you, if you stop mm -hmm. losing. And are you seeing uh, more carriers going that route uh, right now? In other words, is your business growing? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You, one would really hope so. We've made big investments in our products. So, yes, we do see that happening. Good. Jonas, it's great to have you on the show for the first time, and we'll definitely have you back. There's some really good insights there, and we're delighted to talk to you. So please come back and see us again. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. All right, folks, that's it for today's episode. And next week, it'll be the last Wi-Fi Now episode of the year, Wi-Fi Now TV episode, I should say. And we'll be diving into uh, one of my favorite topics, and that's a Wi-Fi first with my very special guest, Narasimya Chari. He's going to come on uh, next week, so don't miss that. That's it for today. Thank you to uh, Jonas uh, from Aptilo, and I'll see you all again next week. Thanks very much. Wi-Fi Now is a production of RCR TV News. To suggest a show topic or to learn more about Wi-Fi Now events, you can reach Klaus Heading at klaus at headingconsulting.com. To find out more about Wi-Fi Now and all things wireless, visit rcrwireless.com.